symposium. So first I would like to uh, invite our first speaker, Professor Prashant Prabhu, who is an assistant professor in audiology at the All India Institute of Speech and Hearing, Mysore, India. Uh, the topic uh, of his presentation is the role of an audiologist in the assessment of hidden hearing loss and cochlear uh, synaptopathy. Hello everyone. Hope all of you are safe and healthy. At the outset, I would uh, like to wish all of you a very happy 30th anniversary celebrations of Faculty of Medicine of University of Kalinia, Sri Lanka. And uh, I'm glad to be invited as a guest speaker uh, to be with all of you today and speak about the topic role of audiologists in the assessment of hidden hearing loss or cochlear synaptopathy. So, I'm working as an assistant professor in audiology at All India Institute of Speech and Hearing, Mysore, India. And I again thank the entire Department uh, of Disability Studies, Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania for having me here. Okay, so to start off, this is the place that I live in. So this is called the city of Mysuru. So this is a city of palaces we, where we have a palace with lights. So we had the recent celebrations of Navratri where we decorate our entire city with the lights. And this is the place where I work. That is the All India Institute of Speech and Hearing Mysore, one of the first institutes uh, uh, to be established in India. And we are there since 1965. And I'm very happy to be a part of this celebration with all of you, though virtually in uh, uh, Sri Lanka and, the, and to be a part of the celebrations with this department and hope hopefully we get to also uh, meet offline too with, uh, I mean, all the COVID restrictions uh, uplifted. Okay, so moving on to the topic. So the agenda for today is what are we talking about? So we will be discussing about what is hidden hearing loss and we'll be talking about what is the pathophysiology of it? What are the possible causes of hidden hearing loss? The audiological assessment, the possible management options and a bit about the clinical and research insights on the hidden hearing loss. So let's imagine you have a patient coming to the clinic and uh, he complains of difficulty understanding speech, especially in noise. And he doesn't have any other autological complaints as in ear pain, ear discharge, no, no vertigo or any other symptoms. His main complaint is he's not able to understand speech much. So that's his main complaint. And you take him to the audiological testing and you do the I mean, regular pure tone audiometry and you got the thresholds, something like this where the pure tone average was less than 15 db hl in both the years and you did the speech recognition threshold that was also correlating with the pure tone average and you did the speech identification or recognition scores in quiet that also showed good responses and the emittance evaluation result showed an a-type tympanogram with acoustic reflexes present so looking at this audiological test result, which is done routinely, our usual interpretation is our testing shows that you have normal hearing. So that's what we would be telling our patients that our testing result, everything shows normal hearing. But this uh, like gives a shock to the patient that they don't agree and they feel that the diagnosis is inaccurate or misleading because they definitely know or the family definitely knows that he cannot understand speech much, especially in a noisy situation. So you are saying normal hearing, but why am I having a hearing loss? So rather than saying our testing shows that you have normal hearing, a better way of uh, approaching such patients is the results of a simple hearing test for within normal limits but we need to go for a detailed comprehensive evaluation of your hearing, including the tests that measure how your ears and your brain process sound. So 
the regular audiometry showed normal hearing but there was something beyond the regular audiogram so something which is abnormal which is not being shown in the audiogram so we need to go into detail and we need to check what could be the possible reason for the difficulty in communication so then the disorder or the pathology that should come to our mind is something called as hidden hearing loss so the term hidden hearing loss refers to we got an audiogram but the audiogram did not show any abnormality so but the client still has a problem so the hearing loss is somewhere hidden beyond the audiogram so that's why we use a term called as hidden hearing loss so whenever in our audiological clinic we encounter patients with normal hearing sensitivity but they do have a uh, hearing problem so then we need to be thinking of hidden hearing loss so this can be seen in maybe a central auditory processing disorder or other other syndromic conditions too but there is a specific pathology called as hidden hearing loss which can also lead to similar audiological manifestation so let's try to uncover what this hidden hearing loss is so this hidden it's a hearing dysfunction which is hidden inside the traditional audiological evaluation so why does a person get hearing, hidden hearing loss let's try to understand the pathophysiology a bit so this term hidden hearing loss or the concept was uh, proposed in 2009 i mean it's a pretty new recent concept by sharon kujawa and charles lieberman so so dr kujawa and lieberman are the first who introduced this new fascinating phenomena of hidden hearing loss so what they basically did was they did it on animal studies especially in rats so what they did was they exposed them with high level of noise so when high level of noise was presented so all of them had a temporary threshold shift that was obvious that because of the noise exposure they had a temporary threshold shift and but after some time what happened was their threshold became normal because there was spontaneous recovery that happens after a temporary threshold shift which is pretty common and the threshold improved or became normal but once they observed uh, their you know their cochleas what happened was there were permanent damages so though the hearing recovered because of the noise exposure there were permanent damages inside the cochlea so which led to which can lead to problems in their understanding is what they propose so they came up with the idea of hidden hearing loss which meant that the thresholds were normal but there could be some physiological damage to the cochlea due to the high level of noise exposure so let us try to understand what this damage uh, is okay so let's try to understand what are the specific pathophysiology so let's briefly look into uh, the basilar membrane so okay so this is your basilar membrane and you have your tectorial membrane here this is the inner hair cells so let us focus only on the inner hair cells now so inner hair cells are the ones which are sensory in nature and uh, they are the ones one second i'll just take the pointer so let us consider the inner hair cell okay so let's consider the inner hair cell and these are the synapses okay so you have your afferent neurons going from here so they are connected to the inner hair cell so because of the potential that is getting generated in the inner hair cell the information gets transducted through the afferent fibers through the synapses so you have a ribbon synapse here which transducts the sounds to the spiral ganglions and then to your auditory nerve so this is the normal auditory structure that all of us know of we have outer hair cells inner hair cell and then you have synapses that is the afferent fibers connecting the inner hair cells so let's look into the through the electron microscope if you look at it it's like you have your synapse that is attached to the inner hair cell and this is your ribbon synapse if you uh, i mean zoom it this is how the ribbon synapse getting attached to the afferent fibers that you know of but what happens if in patients who have exposure to loud noise i mean people who are exposed to loud noise or people who are aged what happens is this is have this happens and this phenomena is referred to as cochlear synaptopathy so let's try to understand what is this cochlear synaptopathy this is your normal in a hair cell and the ribbon synapse but if the person is exposed to high level of noise or through aging what happens is 
if you see here this synaptic junctions are lost you don't have the synaptic connections with the inner hair cell this loss of synaptic junctions is referred to as synaptopathy okay so this is what is the reason that was suspected to be the cause for hidden hearing loss hidden hearing loss is caused because of the noise exposure or due to aging because of which what happens is there would be loss of the ribbon synapses so with aging what can happen is that can lead to the loss of the fibers itself i mean the loss of the spiral ganglions itself so at the initial stages it would be the loss of the synapses with time what can happen is the uh, fibers itself get lost and that can be the reason for hidden hearing loss okay so so that's the reason but one of the common question that all of us would have is I mean why I mean if there is a damage that is happening to the synapse okay so why which is affecting the transduction of the sound why should the person get normal hearing definitely he should have a hearing loss but he is not getting a hearing loss but he is having absolutely normal hearing so the reason for that is explained through this mechanism so when when we say our auditory nerve fibers there are three kinds of nerve fibers that are there in our auditory nerve they are called as low spontaneous rate because of the nerve fibers that they fire we call it as low spontaneous rate medium and high spontaneous rate so if you look at it in the y axis you have the dbsl so for low level of sounds what the the fibers that respond are the high spontaneous rate fibers so there are a bunch of high spontaneous rate fibers which respond even for a low level of sound but the medium responds for maybe if it's a 30 or a 40 db sound but the low spontaneous rate fibers respond only if it is like 40 to 50 db sound okay so now let us go back to this figure so you are, you are getting the loss of synapses and this loss of synapses happens especially for the low spontaneous rate and the medium spontaneous rate fibers so these are the ones which gets maximally damaged or the synapses gets lost of this low synaptic uh, i mean low spontaneous rate fibers so because of which the soft sounds where the high spontaneous rate fibers fire that doesn't get affected so if the soft sounds are not getting affected you will get absolutely normal thresholds but these are the ones which get affected and these are important especially when you go to noisy situation whenever you go to a noisy situation these fibers get masked because of the noise then you are relying mainly on medium and spontaneous nerve fibers for the firing to happen so because of which especially in noise the synapses are lost and you won't be able to perceive speech in presence of noise so that's the mechanism that has been proposed to explain why individuals even though with loss of synapses will have normal hearing because the loss is in the low and medium spontaneous rate fibers so traditionally i mean for even almost 10 years after i mean almost like 8 to 10 years after lieberman and kujawa discovered this hidden hearing loss the major reason that was assumed for hidden hearing loss was cochlear synaptopathy but recent studies have also shown that along with synaptopathy there can be something called as a myelinopathy okay so where there is a demyelination that can also happen and that can also lead to hidden hearing loss so let's try to understand what exactly it is so again you have your uh, neurons and this is the myelin sheath that is they present in your spiral ganglion because of the loud noise exposure or due to aging what can happen is uh, there may be demyelination because of the high noise exposure etc there can be slight loss of the myelin sheath okay so here what you are seeing another component called as hemi node so this is the node which connects to the myelin sheath so after recovery once the recovery happens the myelin sheath can regrow myelin sheath can come back after the temporary threshold shift but what doesn't recover is this hemi nodes okay so that connections to the myelin sheath these hemi nodes are lost so because of which there will be a demyelination even if it recovers the hemi nodes doesn't recover back and that could be another reason for cochlear synapt i mean for hidden hearing loss so hidden hearing loss it could be due to a cochlear synaptopathy or they use a term called as myelinopathy or cochlear demyelination due to which the person can find it difficult to understand speech in presence of noise so this is uh, the basics of why a person uh, would get hidden 
hearing loss. So now let's try to understand what are the causes. I mean, why does a person get uh, hearing loss and which conditions we should be suspecting a hidden hearing loss. So one of the common disorder or a common cause that we need to be aware of is the noise induced hearing loss. So people who are working in a noisy setup, people who are commonly exposed to high level of noise. Okay, so they're definitely at risk for hidden hearing loss. So especially we should be careful in such people to check for the presence of hidden hearing loss. There are some studies which also uh, suspect, I mean, whenever there's a blast trauma, I mean, a sudden loud sound that they hear, that can also damage the synaptic vesicles and that can also lead to hidden hearing loss. The second cause is aging. So aging is the general aging that happens. They may have absolutely normal hearing till 8 kilohertz, but they may have, they may have difficulty understanding speech and noise. So you, you may test a patient who is 50 year old who may have absolutely normal hearing, but he may complain that I somehow feel that I, I don't understand what people speak. In such cases also, we need to suspect, you know, a uh, uh, possible hidden hearing loss because the research evidence shows that the total neuronal count, the total spiral ganglion count reduces with increase in age. So if you clearly see here, the number of uh, uh, neurons drops drastically beyond 40 to 50 years. And then if you see here that uh, number of uh, synapses per IHCs also drop, especially whenever, you know, if it's like above 85, you have very less nerve fibers. I mean, if it is like almost 65, the number of nerve fibers reduce drastically. If it's like 20, you have almost 15 IHCs. I mean, 15 neurons innervating an IHC, but one, it can clearly drop to four to five uh, when the age increases. So the number of nerve fibers itself would reduce and there would be a demyelination that can also occur due to aging. And that can be one of another cause for hidden hearing loss. So a third cause, which has also been reported in the literature is autotoxicity. So whenever we take high doses of maybe an amino glycoside antibiotics, like gentamicin, et cetera, it's mostly causes the damage to the outer hair cell too, but there are, there are chances that the outer hair cells may be spared. And along with that, or uh, sparing the outer hair cells, there could be a damage only to the synapses and that can also lead to uh, hidden hearing loss. So we should be careful in asking history about any intake of autotoxicity also whenever we get patients with absolutely normal hearing. And the other cause for hearing loss is, I mean, all of us love to hear music. So music is something which is very common and it's a recreational thing that all of us enjoy, especially the adolescents and the adults, we enjoy listening to music. But this is turning out to be one of the major cause for hidden hearing loss because more than noise induced hearing loss, we need to worry a lot now about music induced hearing loss because I mean, it's very common to attend concerts with loud noise and we always are like accustomed to wearing uh, earphones for a very long time and we love to hear music at high intensity. So that again is leading to hidden hearing loss. So because of the it's similar to how a noise induced hearing loss can cause a loss in the synaptic vesicle. Similarly, even high level of music exposure can also lead to synaptopathy. So because of that, as audiologists, we should be creating an awareness such that, uh, such that this is something hidden and it is definitely causing more damage. They may not be aware that their hearing is reducing, but their communication ability can get lost and that may not be recoverable at all. Okay, So these are some of the uh, causes for why we get a hidden hearing loss. Okay, so now let's move on to the important aspect. So now I got to know maybe I have a patient who was exposed to loud noise or a music induced hearing loss, or he has an aged person. I have got a normal audiogram, but I'm suspecting hidden hearing loss. So what should I do? Which test should I do to confirm that the person has a hidden hearing loss? I cannot, you know, I cannot do an invasive study to check how many synapses are present or the synapses are lost or not. But do we have any audiological test which can tell us that the person definitely has a hidden hearing loss? Okay, so another important cause or a more important thing that we need to understand is something called a stenitis and hyperacusis. Okay, so one of the thing that we need to understand is there may be people with normal hearing with 
communication problem, but there may be people with tinnitus with absolutely normal hearing. So they have tinnitus with normal hearing and they want to know why are they hearing tinnitus, but the tinnitus can also be associated with hidden hearing loss. So there are ample literature now available which suggests that people with absolutely normal hearing and tinnitus, they may have a cochlear synaptopathy. So why do they hear tinnitus if they have cochlear synaptopathy? Yes, because of the increased central auditory gain. So what do I mean by increased central auditory gain? So why do people hear tinnitus? Is the auditory system is not getting a proper input. So I'm not able to hear some frequency. So what does my brain do? My brain or the central auditory system produces extra sounds and that is heard as tinnitus. I'm not hearing through the normal pathway. So what does my brain do? Brain produces extra sound and that is heard as tinnitus and that is the central auditory gain. So because of the synaptopathy, what is happening is the auditory system is not getting a proper input. So due to which the brain produces those extra sound and that could be the reason for tinnitus or due for hyperacusis. So this is an extremely important thing as audiologists that we should know because uh, if I have get a patient with tinnitus or normal hearing, why is he getting tinnitus? So for me to tell the reason we, sh we can do an assessment to check for hidden hearing loss and tell him that this is the possible reason for getting tinnitus or hyperacusis. So how should we assess if I get a patient with hidden hearing loss? So let us look into this. So one of the thing is DPOE. So this is control subject without any exposure. So after a high level of noise exposure for one day and after eight weeks. So if you see the DPOEs, the order caustic emissions, because of the temporary threshold shift, the OE reduces, but after eight weeks, the, it recovers and becomes normal. So OE cannot be used for identifying hidden hearing loss, but what can be used is this, that is ABR wave one. If you see ABR wave one after one day, the threshold you now or I mean the ABR amplitude reduced, reduced, but even after eight weeks, it did not become normal. It did not come to normal. There was some reduction in the ABR wave one amplitude. So wave one is one which is important for the generation or I mean for the generation of wave one, it is the distal spiral ganglion or the auditory nerve which are responsible for the production of wave one. So those people who have hidden and hearing loss will have definitely a reduced wave one amplitude. So this is an important biomarker that we need to be careful of. So if I want to check hidden hearing loss, I can do an ABR in a patient and if I get a reduced wave one amplitude, then, then definitely that indicates a possible hidden hearing loss. So this is one of the gold standard for identifying hidden hearing loss that is a reduction in the wave one amplitude. So other than this, another common thing, imagine I don't have an ABR equipment, I mean something which is faster and something which is more behaviorally used is speech perception in noise. So this is an extremely important test to identify uh, hidden hearing loss. You can find speech perception uh, in presence of noise for words, sentences, or you can do any monaural low redundancy test. So they score poorly. Those with hidden hearing loss will definitely score poorly and that can indicate a possible synaptopathy. Another clinical indicator, another test which can easily tell us a possible hidden hearing loss is acoustic reflexes. So they have absolutely normal hearing. For normal hearing, we should be getting acoustic reflex threshold at around 85 or 90. But if I'm getting acoustic reflex threshold at 105, 110, where it's like elevated, whenever you get an elevated acoustic reflexes or even an absent acoustic reflexes, then also it can confirm a possible hidden hearing loss. Why? Because the loss of low spontaneous rate nerve fibers. I said low spontaneous nerve fibers are important for slightly louder sounds and that is affected in synaptopathy. So because of which the sounds may not be loud enough to elicit a reflex. So due to which I may get an elevated acoustic reflex. So traditionally, whenever we are doing reflexes, we should be careful and check for an elevation in acoustic reflex. And that can be a, another indicator for hidden hearing loss. So there are other electrophysiological measures. I'm not going into detail. So all, all these are mostly research based. It may not be clinically very relevant, but we can also do an ECOG or envelope following response, ABR and presence of noise. So these are also have been proved as one of the good measures for identifying hidden hearing loss. So, I mean, I'm aware that most of you are practicing audiologists or students. So considering that I'm going into more clinical aspects. So clinically, what we can do is we can do an ABR. 
uh, to check whether if it is hidden hearing loss or uh, emittance that is the acoustic reflexes and definitely speech perception in noise. So these three can be easily done in any clinical setup and that we can use it for identifying uh, hidden hearing loss. So along with that, there are several behavioral measures which we can use. So we published a recent article in this June 2021, where we did a systematic review to check the possible behavioral audiological tests, which can be used for cochlear synaptopathy, along with speech perception in noise. If you have the option of doing a high frequency audiometry, that can also be used uh, as one of the indicator for hidden hearing loss. The traditional, traditionally, they may not show hearing loss, but the damage can be beyond 8K, then you can use a high frequency audiometry. Tone in noise test along with uh, speech in noise test. Along with speech in noise, we can also use tone in noise that is presenting tone and noise in the same ear and checking the responses. So, uh, people with hidden hearing loss will have elevated tone thresholds in presence of noise. So, that can be another tool that can be used for identifying hidden hearing loss. So we said that we can use all this to identify hidden hearing loss. I've done all that and I've said that, okay, the person will have hidden hearing loss or may, may have a hidden hearing loss. So what next? So what are the possible management options? As audiologists, I should be able to uh, tell the patient what should be done next. So what are the possible more options? So there is a lot of research that has been happening, especially in the animal models, where they are trying to inject neurotrophins to increase the synaptic junctions. Okay, so this is the normal synapse, and you have uh, synaptopathy here with, because the synapses are lost. Then there are drug treatment that are given. The neurotrophins are given such that the synapse can regenerate. Okay, so this is one thing which is going on in research stage. So people have been doing it on animal models and that have been successful, but still human trials are yet to be uh, established so that this can be a potential treatment. So if you identify patients with hidden hearing loss, we can uh, have you know medical management that is drug treatment uh, through which the synapses can be regenerated. So, but we don't have it right now. So what can be done as audiologists? So they don't have hearing loss. So because of that, I can't give them a hearing aid because they have absolutely normal hearing or a very less hearing loss. But what I can give them is an assistive listening device because their main complaint is communication. So they have, and especially in presence of noise. So there are lots of assistive listening technology available. It could be an FM device or an infrared device or a Bluetooth streamer or anything where it can stream directly to the person and all that. So these are the assistive listening devices which as audiologists we can recommend to patients such that they're able to communicate better and that can uh, I mean, help them if they have any hidden hearing loss. So for people who cannot maybe afford such uh, uh, devices uh, and in such patients what we need to uh, teach them are communication strategies so we all know the anticipated and replace strategies which the patient can use so we need to inform the patient and also the caregiver to use different communication strategies such that uh, they'll be able to you know uh, communicate better so uh, have sessions where you teach them proper communication strategies such that they don't face any uh, communication breakdown okay so other than this informational counseling is extremely important they want to know why are they experiencing the problem you should explain them why they are getting it why are they getting tinnitus why are they getting hyperacusis why do they have speech understanding in noise problems so give them that assurance and tell them that because of the noise exposure they should reduce the noise exposure and all that such that the loss doesn't progress so all that informational counseling is extremely important and that can really help the patient okay so so roughly there is no standard protocol available but based on the research literature this is the protocol that i suggest that we can use in the assessment we need to take a detailed case history and check whether the person is having any noise exposure or music exposure or autotoxic drug use which can suggest a possible hidden hearing loss and we need to do a speech perception in noise test acoustic reflexes and abr and check for the reduction in wave one amplitude this is uh, uh, easily done in any clinic. So all of us, whenever we get patients with normal hearing and having a communication problem or with tinnitus and hyperacusis, we can administer all these tests and check for a possible presence of hidden hearing loss. So for management, what we need to do uh, to summarize is just like you can suggest a possible assistive listening devices, uh, teach them communication strategies, give them a proper informational counseling and this is another thing which has not been tried but we can always try like how we give training for uh, you know 
under speech understanding in noise we can always give an auditory training for improvement of speech in noise and that can also help people with uh, hidden hearing loss so clinical and research insights so as audiologists we should be aware of the condition called as hidden hearing loss and we should not miss saying that we have absolutely normal hearing you are just exaggerating the hearing loss so we should be careful about the hearing hidden hearing loss and also we should create awareness about this possible hidden hearing loss uh, especially to avoid exposing to loud noise and loud music etc and as audiologists we should be knowing what test to do to assess and what are the possible management options so from a research angle we should be developing a standard protocol for assessment so there has to be steps taken towards developing a standard protocol for assessment of hidden hearing loss and there is a need for developing appropriate management strategies for uh, individuals with hidden hearing loss so with this brief uh, overview about hidden hearing loss uh, i would like to end the talk with this thing as in like world hearing day who has come out that we will be celebrating a third march uh, world hearing day and i thought this would be relevant because the theme for the next year is to hear for life and listen with care so they are proposing that we need to be careful whenever uh, i mean they are proposing that safe listening that is not getting exposed to loud noise and loud music so this can help to prevent uh, hidden hearing loss as well so i would be there for the discussion but along with that if you have any further queries you can always email me and you can contact me uh, and i mean from india and from sri lanka we need to uh, come up with a lot of research to i mean uh, this is what another thing that i just want to propose to all of you that we can always collaborate and we can come up with uh, good research output uh, though we are in the developing countries so we have we have we have a lot of clinical experience and clinical research but we don't publish a lot but so we need to work towards that also and uh, uh, and come up with good uh, uh, research uh, Uh, article so with that i would like to thank and this is one picture uh, all of you would remember this is professor manjula giving a tv talk and she was one of the professor visiting faculty for university of kalinia and uh, i am happy to share with all of you that i am her student i did my masters dissertation under professor manjula and i am very happy that i'm uh, i'm passing the legacy here and i'm uh, invited to give you all a guest lecture Uh, here and uh, uh, ma'am would be extremely happy that uh, i gave a lecture for at this university and thank you again for this opportunity to be with all of you and uh, share my uh, experience or information related to uh, hidden hearing loss and uh, my best wishes to all of you for the 30th uh, anniversary celebration and i'll be uh, there with you and i'm eager to uh, discuss with all of you and meeting with you of uh, meeting with you and uh, discuss more about if you have any queries related to what we discussed today so thank you again for inviting me have a good day ahead thank you professor prabhu that was a very interesting presentation you did so we'll have the questions related to that uh, presentation after the symposium so now i want to invite a second speaker Ms. Aisha Nazir Farooq. She is a senior consultant audiologist and speech language pathologist at the Vikramarachi Institute of Speech and Hearing. Her topic for today is the role of an audiologist for individuals with cochlear implants in Sri Lanka. Thank you, Dinamshi. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the warm welcome. Let me give you a small introduction about myself. My name is Aisha Nazir Zarouk. I've been working at Vikramarachi for the past nine years, and I've done my uh, just a little bit about my education. I've done my bachelor's and master's from Sri Ramachandra University, Chennai, India. Um, it's an honor to actually follow a, uh, uh, Dr. Prabhu. Uh, I, I have actually followed his work. and it was a very interesting topic for all of us so mine will be a little bit different i will be talking about the technological advancements and the uh, importance of oral rehabilitation in cochlear implants so most of you all so let's just get started 
Most of y'all, I'm sure all of y'all know what a cochlear implant is. So cochlear implant is an electrically, surgically implanted uh, device that, ha that has an external part as well as an internal part. So the external part, the signals are picked up from the microphone and the, through the speech processing, uh, the signals are digitized and then via the transmitter, it is transmitted into the implanted receiver stimulator and through the electrode array, the signals pass into the, uh, or it's directly stimulated into the auditory nerve. So just a little bit of uh, this uh, a schematic diagram about how the cochlea works. So this is the electrode array, and there is electrical stimulation that happens through which there's direct audit, uh, uh, there is stimulation of the auditory nerve happening, right? So now we, I will be talking about the advancements in cochlear implant over the years. So currently, these are the uh, cochlear implant types that are present in, in the market right now. So there are the behind the ear ones, which are also very technologically advanced, followed by there are the off the ear solutions as well, as you can see, these are the off the ear ones. And then there is something called the hybrid implants as well, which actually has an uh, acoustic stimulation via for people who have low, uh, mild to moderate hearing loss, as well as people who have severe to profound dead regions, there will be an implantable solution for that. So it's like a hybrid, a mixture of the uh, electrical stimulation as well as the acoustic stimulation. So these are the options available for cochlear implants. So before we actually touch up on like the advancements, let's just look into a little bit about the evaluation of cochlear implant candidacy. The reason we, uh, I know most of you all already know about this, but the reason I want to touch up on this a little bit about uh, the candidacy is because most of us tend to forget why um, we have to go into detailed evaluation, especially as a role of, as an audiologist. Not only is it uh, necessary for us to diagnose and find out why, uh, whether the person is a candidate for cochlear implant or not, but it's also important to understand how much cochlear implant will in, uh, influence or benefit that particular person or the family. So it's not just our role as audiologists to just do the diagnosis and see whether they are severe to profound hearing loss patients who need cochlear implant, but it's also important for us to know about what are the advancements available and also the age, how much uh, cochlear implant is going to help this particular person and all those things. So along with degree, so we do further evaluations to consider degree of hearing loss as well as how much they have benefited from hearing aids, whether it has benefited them or not, and if we need to go for cochlear implants, but it's also important to see that duration of deafness. So duration of deafness is one of the main factors that help with the prognosis of cochlear implant, especially when we diagnose them early and when we refer them to, uh, when, they, when we recommend a cochlear implant earlier, like I said, the less, lesser the age, the better, especially to see the prognosis. So along with that, it's very important for us to focus on family expectations and support. So especially like when we talk about family expectations, uh, if it's an older child, we have to make sure that they know that it's not just hearing, uh, it's not just by giving them the cochlear implant, it's not that they're getting just uh, hearing and they're fine. We need to make them understand that if they're older, their speech might not get developed as per expected and all those things. So it's very important for, them, for us to, as audiologists, to give them an idea about the realistic expectations as well as how much we need to know how much they're motivated to go for an implant as well. Okay, so what is the right age to do an implant? Uh, back in the days, way back in 1984, the, uh, the FDA had given approval to do cochlear implants only for adults. Then it went, up to, went down to about two years in 1990, followed by in 1998, 18 months, then it stopped at uh, 12 months for a very long time. Finally, in 2020, FDA gave permission to uh, uh, go ahead and do uh, cochlear implant surgeries for babies as young as nine months of age. So, but then off the label, there are young children as young as three months, done even in countries like US and four months in other countries as well. Okay, so when we consider the best age for cochlear implantation, uh, we need to understand that until the age of seven, there is a critical period of language acquisition. 
So when we say the first three years is actually the ideal and the most optimal age for implant. That doesn't mean you can't implant them later. From three to seven months, uh, seven years, it's also ideal to do implants. It is suitable provided they get the intensive auditory, auditory rehabilitation. And there is, of course, questionable, uh, uh, there's an outcome which, which is variable if you do surgeries from seven years and above. Okay, so just a little bit of a uh, look into the role of audiologists in cochlear implants. So we as audiologists, we have a big role to play when it comes to cochlear implant. It's not just before or after, There's, it's actually an entire journey. The surgeon will probably be there just to do the surgery, but as audiologists, we are there from the get-go till the end, okay, following through. I would say throughout the life actually. So when, uh, so as audiologists pre-implant, we obviously do the detailed audiological evaluations. I don't want to go into detail about that. I'm sure all of you all know. And also counseling is also very important. You need to talk to the parents about what they need, what are the requirements, they, what are they expecting, even if it's a ch child or an adult, what are their lifestyles, and also know about the types of implants and processes that are available so that you can give a proper counseling about the, pre about the implant. During intraoperatively, also an audiologist is there. We will look into a little bit about the re recent advancements in the later slides. But basically, in the intraoperative intra uh, setup, the audiologist will be there to do the measurement of electrode impedance to see if the, the implant, implant is working properly or not, as well as other objective measurements. Post-op is, uh, is actually one of the most important roles. So where we do the switch on, we do the mapping of the programming followed by troubleshooting. So along with that, oral rehabilitation is also very important as well as there is uh, other follow-up tests to see how much of, uh, audiology, uh, how much uh, uh, the child is benefiting from the cochlear implant by doing aided testing, speech tests as well as if needed, we also do EABR this day and age. E EABR is usually done when the child is very small and they are unable to, uh, they are not doing good, uh, they are not showing good responses with the maps and there is a question as to whether the implant is working or not. In that case, we will end up doing an EABR just to confirm that, okay, there is nerve stimulation happening. So this is a frequent practice specially done for children with other disabilities and hearing loss as well. Okay, so even when we look into a basic audiogram, how it has advanced is back in the days, way back in like in the 80s and th uh, times like that, the hearing, uh, the cochlear implant was only recommended when there was no response, absolutely no hearing and no benefit from hearing aids is when a cochlear implant was recommended. But now the candidacy criteria has expanded. So you will see that, you know, even people with audiograms like this, where there is like a moderate to profound loss like this where you see uh, people uh, tend to go for cochlear implants, especially when there is like a 40% sentence perception in the worse year as well as up to 70% sentence perception in the better year. Okay, looking a little bit into the innovation in the implant. So I will be talking a little bit about how the implant as well as the processes have innovated with time. So now, back in the days, the implants used to be slightly bigger and you could see a bit of a bulge. The surgeons were a bit more reluctant, uh, take, they take more time, it wasn't very, uh, uh, it wasn't a very uh, tiny, uh, robust device, but now it has actually developed and uh, with, uh, especially this day and age, we see implants that are so thin that you, they, you can't even see a bulge on the skull of the uh, person. So, and there are, op there are options of removable magnet as well. So especially in case of like MRIs where they have to go for above three Tesla, they have the option of slightly removing, doing a small cut and slightly removing the magnet. So this is, this is also considered a big innovation because back in the days, doing an MRI was something that they were reluctant when they were having an implant. So most of the uh, companies now have this option of having MRI cap uh, com uh, capabilities when you, when you have an implant. So uh, along with that, the Im uh, implants also have options of the arrays, which have uh, three different types of arrays. One is called the lateral wall array, which is the straight array. 
Then more, more advanced to that is called the modular hugging array, where you know it goes and hugs the modulus of the cochlea and which gives better, stim better responses that way. As well as very slim, uh, slim modular hugging uh, uh, implants as well. So these slim modular hugging implants are used mostly for people who want to preserve their residual hearing. Okay, so these are all the advancements in the implants that are available. When we look into the processor, the, there is a, uh, you can see in the image as well, there is a proper advancement in the, uh, in the history. Like when it started off, it was a body-worn big processor and with time it became small and now it's come to an extent where it is off the ear, tiny as well as wireless, so uh, as well as rechargeable. So these are all uh, complete innovations that you see over the period of time. Uh, along with the fact that it's off the ear and very small, you can also uh, see that they have so many other technological advancements. Like one of the main thing is that it's splash proof and uh, it has this wireless connectivity that is there. So uh, they have this option where you can automatically change, uh, the environment automatically changes, uh, it scans and changes according to the environment that you are in. So uh, these are the uh, things that you used to not see before. Before the processors had this option where you wear the processor and manually change the program. If you're in a noisy environment, you put an uh, option where you're in the noisy environment. Now the processors have developed in a way that you can actually see uh, automatic changes. There is an app where you can actually see that, you know, when the child moves from the noisy place to like a music area, it automatically changes to the music environment or like to, to a windy place, then it changes to the windy environment. So everything is automated now. Along with that, there's also an option where you can um, monitor their data, like how, how much they're using the hearing aid, at what all environments, everything can be tracked as well. So, and one of the main things is wireless connectivity. You can now in completely connect these uh, implants to iPhones or Android phones. They're wirelessly connected. They can directly stream as well as uh, they have these other wireless devices that you can, or even uh, FM devices, you can, connect, like, you can connect them wirelessly to other FM devices as well, or other, other uh, like mini mics and a phone clip, even to a TV. So multiple recipients can use these devices. So these are all basically the technological innovations that are there in the processors now. As well as another factor, another fact uh, is that these uh, processors are also compatible with certain hearing aids. So you can even see like a bimodal, like you know, if you have one ear with a hearing aid, another ear with a uh, processor, both these are bimodally, like both these are connected to the same streaming devices, so that they have that bilateral hearing. So anyway, now bilateral uh, hearing is something that every uh, every uh, audiologist should focus on. So this is one thing that even uh, even the recent advances is about bilateral fitting of hearing aids or bilateral fitting of cochlear implants. So even if they are unable to fit a child with hear, uh, implants on other ear and one ear, it's always recommended to fit at least a good hearing aid on the other side, right? So along with that, the other additional features which I find very fascinating as well is called the Find My Processor, especially very, very useful for children who, uh, who tend to you know, leave their processors here and there, especially if they go out to a park or to the school and things. So they, you, can GPS, you can track the processor via GPS. So that's another feature. This is, a com uh, this is a comparatively new feature which is called Forward Focus, where we have a person, especially for people, uh, people who wear bilateral uh, cochlear implants who are in like a party or a noisy environment who tend to struggle a little bit in the presence of music, noise and having conversations, they have actually an uh, option to do some, uh, to use an option called forward, forward focus where they can use the hearing, aid, where they can uh, use this option to just focus on the person sits uh, from the front and or everything around their background will get a little bit uh, subtle and low. So this is something even better than normal hearing actually. So it's, it, uses, it reduces the noise coming from behind so the person can uh, enjoy more face-to-face -face conversation. So along with that, we have the wireless interop monitoring as well. Where now the this image is about how those days the audiologists used to take the 
laptop as well as the wire pod and everything into the theater. But now we have just a small remote that we take into the operation theater where we just, with the press of a button, we can do all the intraoperative testings. Along with that, even there is Bluetooth em enabled programming interface. This is one of the most useful uh, setups because over here we actually see children more comfortable to do uh, mapping because back in the days when you try to do mapping and you try to switch on, they start crying and all those things because of the wires connected and they get a bit intimidated. So with this wireless programming setup, we can, uh, we can use it in a more uh, natural environment and we can program the uh, cochlear implant in a more natural environment. So I will just quickly touch up a little bit about the importance of auditory rehabilitation as well. So now we all know that fe uh, fetal development, uh, with fetal de development itself, the hearing starts developing. From, the, uh, uh, from 26 weeks of gestation itself, the entire cochlea is developed. So babies actually learn from day one. And hearing is one of the most important factors that we see in when it, uh, for literacy, actually, because uh, through hearing there is more growth in the neural connection and this actually lays the foundation for literacy. So that during the first few years you see about 700 neural connections from every, for, from every second. So 80% of brain growth happens in the first three years of life. So by age two to three years the child has already heard about 30,000 words. So this is one very important factor that we need to consider. Hearing loss is not just about the ear. It's about developing the brain. So we usually say we hear from the brain, not from the ears. So ears is just a way in. Right? So basically, hearing loss is just a doorway problem. So what I'm trying to uh, emphasize here is that when there is a problem with the uh, here, when there is a problem with the cochlea, it means that there is the entrance is where the problem is. The entire brain has no issues, so it just obstructs. So hearing loss just obstructs this doorway. So this just prevents the sound from entering into the brain, right? So why, if we do cochlear implants or he give them a hearing a hearing aid, we break this doorway, and this allows the a proper access of this neural connection and everything. And this is why it's very important to know that children with hearing loss don't have any uh, cognitive issues or any, uh, unless they have any associated problems, they don't have any cognitive issues. So once we fit them early and once we give them the correct stimulation, they are just like any other normal child and they, they should actually aim to go for a good mainstream school. So early identification and immediate use of hearing technology with appropriate technology and proper acoustic accessibility as well as enriched auditory exposure will give very good results. So just, just an idea for everybody. When, uh, even when a child is diagnosed with hearing loss, as early as let's say even three months or six months, they are still having a delay. So even when a child is fitted with a hearing technology as early as one year, they still have a delay of about one year. If they are fitted at two years, they have a delay of two years. So remember, even with that early diagnosis and early intervention, there is still a delay. So it's very, very important to give that proper auditory, uh, auditory uh, exposure because there are lots of studies that actually show that you need a lot of auditory, influ uh, auditory exposure to influence the developing neural structures. So even in normal circumstances, you need about 10,000 hours of practice as uh, children, normal hearing children need, a, uh, by the time they are four years of age, they have about 45 million words. And it shows that children with hearing loss need actually three times more uh, exposure to sounds than normal children because of their limited bandwidth. Now, ch uh, normal hearing children have a cochlea with thousands and thousands of hair cells, but then p children with cochlear implants are just given that 22 pairs of electrodes that have to comprise all those bandwidths into one, into a, uh, like if you get what I mean. So that's why you, they need that proper auditory exposure. Okay, so um, I'll just skip this. So what does literature actually say? Literature says that 40% of speech sounds are visible through the lips. So the remaining 60% have to be heard. So children with hearing loss 
they they may pick up language through speech reading but they need that auditory exposure to actually start speaking and le learn all the words right so they have a better chance children who are hearing children with hearing loss who have that auditory exposure will have a better chance and if they are auditory learners they'll have a better chance to be put into mainstream schools okay so enrich uh, auditory exposure is needed that is why we do something called auditory verbal therapy so auditory verbal therapy is a family focused early intervention education option so remember it's a little different from speech therapy because speech therapy is something that we actually sit and train the child to speak but auditory verbal therapy we are mainly acting as coaches here to guides to uh, teach the parents or people who are completely involved with them to get that proper auditory exposure so it's a parent based all day listening uh, technique where we uh, we teach them techniques and we teach the parents how to go about with uh, com giving them that complete auditory exposure right so uh, there have been studies that have shown that there are family based into uh, by doing this family based intervention you do see a very very good a uh, successful uh, cochlear implant uh, program especially like th there was a study that they they took uh, they did a four year long study where they actually uh, monitored children who are pop uh, who are do uh, who have parents who, are, who have been continuously talking to them and they uh, they emphasize the authors emphasize that doing this home linguistic and uh, having this proper home listening linguistic environment was very important to see uh, to see a very good prognosis with children with cochlear implant right so in a nutshell to everything that i was talking today if we give the correct appropriate technology whether it's hearing aids for mild to severe uh, mod, mild to moderately severe hearing loss or cochlear implants for severe to profound with the proper oral rehabilitation i can emphasize this enough oral rehabilitation is very very important for especially children who are implanted at the correct age okay they are the ones who would be lining up being good speaking children with good prognosis okay thank you thank you aisha for your very interesting presentation so we'll take up the questions after the symposium so now i want to welcome uh, professor david welch he's an assistant professor in audiology at the university of auckland in new zealand the topic uh, done by him today will be on prevention of noise induced hearing loss hello my name is David Welch. I'm the head of audiology at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. And I'm very honored to have been asked to present at the University of Kalanir's 30th anniversary. So today I'm going to talk to you about a body of research that we've conducted over many years into the prevention of noise induced hearing loss. Noise-induced hearing loss, as most of us know, is a devastating condition. Hearing loss in general has terrible impacts on people, on the individual affected directly, and on those around them so that it affects the whole of society. We know that about one in six cases of hearing loss are due to exposure to noise, and of course, most of the rest of the cases are due to age. So noise-induced hearing loss tends to impact people when they're younger and therefore has even worse impacts on society than does age-related hearing loss. In summary, noise-induced hearing loss is really the only kind of hearing loss that we can influence, that we can try to prevent. Uh, so it's been the focus of a lot of the research that we've done into the prevention of hearing loss. We all know, as we've just discussed, that hearing loss is very bad, but our society tends to suggest that, he that he loud sounds, which can damage hearing, are, are good things. This uh, next slide is just from a, a quick Google search on, on loudness and noise. 
and you get these rather positive images. You get um, uh, this fun, exciting kind of ideas associated with noise exposure. Welcome to our happy, crazy, fun, loud home, to read out one of them at random. So loudness and loud noise tends to be associated in people's minds with having fun and enjoyment. On the other hand, the messages that we see around quietness tend to have negative connotations and, and seem rather officious. Again, a similar quick Google search on, on the idea of quiet brings out things like this, pictures of policemen, officious signs trying to stop noise. Um, I like this little cartoon with the, these people ch standing around chatting happily and the little fellow putting up a, a sign saying, quiet, please. So it's a sort of a kill joy sort of sense. And that creates a real problem. If we're trying to prevent noise-induced hearing loss, and we're trying to do that to people who've been exposed to those kinds of social message, it's very, very hard to get through to them. If you think even subconsciously of loud noise as fun and, and normal, and people who are trying to say, let's be quiet and protect your hearing as kind of miserable and officious, you're not really going to be very likely to listen to that kind of person. So the question we, we started in our research was really how can we get through to people? How can we convince them? Well, we came up with two answers. One answer is get to people early. Try to get through to people when they're still children so that they haven't yet been conditioned by that way of thinking about noise. And when you get to them, try to make the message interesting being <coughs> interesting and engaging, so that instead of coming across as, as a, um, a boring killjoy, your message comes across as something fun and interesting in itself. And that was where we came upon this concept of dangerous decibels. It's a hearing health promotion program that was developed in the USA at a university called Oregon Health Science University. It was designed to be a fun and interactive training session for children aged between 8 and 12 years. That's really a sweet spot in people's maturation. You're old enough that you're capable of dealing with complicated concepts, but you're not yet so old that you've been conditioned by society to think of noise as fun and exciting. Dangerous Decibels has a set of modules within it, nine modules. I'll tell you more about those in a minute but they fit together into a good story. And all in all, it takes 45 minutes to present the program. This is just a, a quick explanation of how we deliver the Dangerous Decibels training. We start with an expert team. Um, and in New Zealand, we've got a group which consists of um, a, a combination of audiologists, acousticians, public health experts who each take charge of particular areas of the training. We then run workshops. Those workshops last two days. And across those two days, we train the educators, as they're called, in how to um, understand how the ear works, how noise can influence our hearing, and the impacts of hearing loss on people. That's what we think of as background knowledge. And then on day two, we focus on the delivery of the dangerous decibels program, so standing up in front of a group of children, talking to them in an interesting way. Once they've gone through that two days of training, we certify people as educators, dangerous decibels educators, who are able to go out and deliver that 45-minute session of dangerous decibels to groups of usually 8 to 12-year-old children. Those nine modules I mentioned to you before are these. Um, we teach the children about sound, or what sound is, how, how there's energy in it. We teach them about the ear and the fact that there's much more to it than what we can see on the outside of the head. Uh, we, we tell them about hearing and the processes that go on within the ear as we convert the energy that makes up sound into information in our nerve pathways. Then we explain how the ear gets damaged by noise. Um, we, we show how hair cells can be destroyed, how stereocilia get damaged. And then we move on in the fifth module 
to, to giving a demonstration of hearing loss, a, a simulation, electronic simulation of what it would be like to hear sounds with a hearing loss. We then talk to the children about sources of loud sound to which they may be exposed. And then we get on to showing them how to protect themselves, how to distance themselves from sound sources and how to fit earplugs properly. We also give them a set of earplugs so that they go away from the training, not only knowing how to protect themselves, but also having the wherewithal to do it. And we finish in the ninth module by talking to them about an imaginary situation where they're exposed to noise and how they need to look after their friends as well as themselves to make sure everybody can protect their hearing. So the nine modules together tell quite a nice story about how hearing works. The children find it very fun, and we find it fun, actually, delivering it. The photograph on the right is a group of children from a primary school in Auckland where um, we, we ran the Dangerous Decibels program. And that thing they're playing with, it's a, um, a mannequin. We call it Jezebel, and it allows you to measure. You can see this little chap in the foreground here is holding a sound level meter in his hand. That sound level meter is part of this mannequin. It allows you to measure the output sound level of earbuds. So if somebody's listening to music through their phone, they can put their earbud into the, the mannequin's ear and read out what the sound level is that they're being exposed to through the, the sound level meter that's attached. And a key part of the Dangerous Decibels program is that we've always assessed its effectiveness. We believe it's very important to evaluate health promotion programs. The danger of delivering a health promotion program without evaluation is that you're doing something that's well-meaning, but might actually be a waste of time for all concerned if the people who undergo the training don't actually end up exhibiting um, better health behavior. The original Dangerous Decibels group in the USA had developed a questionnaire. Uh, it was designed to assess knowledge, attitudes, and behavior around loud sound. And they delivered it before and after training to assess whether the training had been effective. This graph here shows what we know about the effectiveness of the children's um, version of the Dangerous Decibels program as assessed by the American group. You can see, if you look at, it's a rather complex figure, but if you look at this blue line, this represents the standard version of the classroom training. So before they were trained, the children knew very little about sound and noise and the impact on hearing. After training using the Dangerous Decibels program, they scored much more highly. And that, that was a, a week later. And then three months later, their level of knowledge was still high. These other lines represent control groups, really. So the, this black line that's labeled control was a, a group of children who received no training at all. The other lines represent children playing with a, an exhibit in a museum or playing with some online computer games that technically provided the same knowledge as the Dangerous Decibels program, but obviously didn't have anywhere near as, as strong an effect. The red line represents a community-based program. And you can see the effectiveness is quite similar to the, the full version of the Dangerous Decibels program. In the community-based version, there was involvement of the children's families and, and others as well. So it's just a, a, another way of delivering it. But the main message from this diagram is that we know that the classroom Dangerous Decibels program is effective. 10 years ago, uh, in 2011, the American group came to Auckland and delivered the Dangerous Decibels training to groups of people here. And as they were here, they trained our team. Um, and this, this photograph is a mixture of the Americans who, who came over and our New Zealand team who went on to deliver the Dangerous Decibels training in New Zealand. Uh, we have since that training run many educator training workshops and we've also conducted research around the program, which we think is very important to make sure that the program keeps improving and, and stays relevant to people. The research that we've already conducted has mostly focused on the application of 
the dangerous decibels training to groups other than children to adults. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that first before getting on to the approaches to improving the program, which is what we're in the process of working on at the moment. In that, we're thinking about how we can shorten the program potentially. 45 minutes is not long, long, but sometimes it's too long for conditions where we find ourselves. And so we're looking to see whether we can shorten the program without losing its effectiveness. We're also thinking, can we add to it? The program as it stands with nine modules covers a lot of material, but there are some areas that, we that it doesn't really cover and that we'd like to add to. So we'd like to investigate whether adding those elements to the program have an impact on it. Do they improve it? Or do they somehow interfere with the main messages and, and, and make it weaker? But to start with, I'm going to tell you about the research that we've done into applying the Dangerous Decibels program to adults. We used the same basic components. So the same nine modules, um, we changed some of the examples within those, but those same nine things that I showed you before are, are still in the adult program. We still have all the interactivity. So one of the elements of the children's program is that there are a lot of games, a lot of asking questions of the audience and getting them to interact with the presenters. So it's not like a lecture where you're standing up there telling people stuff. It's, it's fun, it's interactive. We maintain that in the adult version of the program as well. And it's seemed to have worked very effectively. We've also kept the length of the same for the adult program. Um, with adults, it's sometimes tempting to get into a lot more technical detail. However, we have found that keeping it relatively simple makes it relevant and makes people interested in it. Um, as I've said at the bottom of the slide here, we did alter some of the examples and demonstrations. So where with children, we might talk about the dangers of um, loud noise from fireworks or uh, playing computer games with your headphones on and the volume turned up loud. With adults in a noisy workplace, we might instead talk about the noise levels created by the machinery or the equipment that they're using, while still preserving the same general message. We also adapted the assessment questionnaire. I mentioned earlier that the American group had developed a knowledge, attitudes and behavior questionnaire. We kept that, altering the questions just slightly to make them more appropriate for adults. But we also acknowledge that in a workplace environment, self-reported behavior may be questionable because workers are required to use hearing protection and protect themselves in noise. There may be factors that contribute to their answering in, in ways that aren't exactly true. So in order to get a better measure, we interviewed workers about the factors that help them to protect their hearing or prevent them from doing so when they're actually in the workplace. And we created two new scales, supports and barriers to good hearing protection behavior that we added to the questionnaire so that it's now a five scale questionnaire with knowledge, attitudes, behavior, supports and barriers. The supports um, are factors that a person, that, or sorry, that the people we talked to mentioned were reasons why they did wear their hearing protection. Their work match reminded them to wear them. Um, they wanted to keep their hearing good because they wanted to have good lives with their family. It was the rules of the company, that kind of thing. And on the other hand, the barriers are reasons why they don't wear their earmuffs or earplugs when they are exposed to noise at work. Um, because they're uncomfortable, because they get in the way of, of other safety equipment, a helmet they might have to wear, um, because their co-workers mock them or joke at them when they wear them. Uh, so these kind of factors that are, are very real when you're in a workplace that act, can potentially act as a barrier to doing the sensible thing and protecting your hearing. These are just some photographs of groups of workers uh, from different small companies in Auckland who we trained. Uh, you can see these are happy looking chaps. This training was done in their tea room at their, their factory. And you can see some of the materials that we use, photographs, microscope photographs of hair cells, um, nice, simple, clear messages of, of the dangerous um, levels of noise and ways to protect yourself. Uh, this was an example of a, a, a factory where they didn't have a tea room. They didn't have an appropriate place inside. So um, the, the boss let the 
let the workforce just knock off half an hour early. And they gathered outside in the car park where we, we did the demonstration there. This is a, a photograph of recruits from, from the New Zealand Army being trained with the Dangerous Death Spells program. And you can see they've got in their hands these bunches of pipe cleaners. We use those to, to represent stereo cilia of a hair cell and show them how they can get damaged by, by noise. Overall, the workplace program was highly effective. So this graph here shows the supports to barriers ratio. So those are those two scales that I mentioned before that we are using as proxies of, of good hearing health behavior. Um, the more the supports to barriers ratio, the better people are behaving. And you can see on this graph, the pre-intervention um, workers had lower support to barriers ratios. After a week after training, it was improved and that improvement was maintained for months afterwards. So we were, we were pretty pleased with the workplace program. We found that people who are exposed to noise day in and day out really got this and they really appreciated having it explained properly and clearly and in a way that wasn't too boring and dry. We also assessed the benefit to teenaged educators. So the educators, remember, are the people who train the primary school children about dangerous decibels. We trained older school children as educators because we know that teaching other people is a very effective way to learn something oneself. And we then got those teenagers to del deliver the dangerous decibels training in three of their local primary schools. This is just a photograph of some of the 16 year olds being trained to fit earplugs properly, as you can see there. Uh, and we found there were good improvements in knowledge and behavior. Um, as you can see, similarly shaped graphs to the ones we've seen before. Pre-training uh, levels were relatively low. Post-training, they improved and were generally maintained at the three-month follow-up. Attitudes didn't change particularly. And we think that's more to do with the scale that we were using to measure attitudes, which perhaps wasn't quite appropriate for a teenager, group of teenagers. We found that the supports did increase, but interestingly, the barriers didn't, they improved slightly, but this wasn't a significant improvement in barriers. Um, so when we, when we looked into what those barriers were, we found that while we reduced some of the barriers from pre-training, uh, new barriers cropped up. So for example, before training, most of the teenagers didn't own earplugs, so they, they couldn't use them to protect themselves. We gave them earplugs, of course, as part of the training. But then in the, the, when we asked them about barriers post-training, many of them said things like they forgot their earplugs when they were exposed to noise or they weren't expecting the noise exposure. So that's an area for some further research, we think. But in summary, the, the research that we and our American colleagues have done to date suggests that the Dangerous Decibles Program is effective in childhood, that it also works in teenage years if the teenagers are involved in delivering the training, and that it is very effective in adults who are exposed to noise in the workplace. However, the Dangerous Decibels Program is what you might call a monolith, a monolith being a big single lump of rock, as in my, my photograph on the side there. We know that it works well as it is. We've done all our research around the 45 minute nine module program. What we don't know is what would happen if we shortened it? What would happen if we took out a module or two? And furthermore, what would happen if we added new modules? One of the areas we feel we'd like to talk more about in the training is tinnitus, uh, because that's something that even quite young people can experience if they've been exposed to noise. But at the moment, we don't know if we added more material to the program, would we perhaps distract from the main messages? So we want to be able to look into this. And th these are, what I was talking about earlier is ways that we're hoping we can use to improve the program. This is where Eranti came in. Eranti is, of course, a lecturer in audiology at the University of Kalania. And I've got a, a couple of nice photographs of her here. here. Here she is with some of her colleagues. This is before she came to New Zealand. And here's a photograph of her and her daughter, Movindi, you can see they're wrapped up nice and warm for the New Zealand conditions. Um, and we're really enjoying having Aranti with us, with us for the time that she's here as a, as a PhD student. 
where she's investigating what, what will happen if we change the Dangerous Death Spells program in, that, in those ways that I've talked about. So the question that faced Aranthi when she arrived was, how do you improve something that we know already works? And these are what we decided. Firstly, we need to develop a tool that we can use to measure the effectiveness or otherwise of the changes we make. Then we try removing bits of the program, and then we can try adding parts to the program. So the tool to assess the effectiveness is a new questionnaire. And Aranthi has been working on, on, on this over the last um, year or two. She's been looking into how to test the details of learning according to each of those nine modules. So I, I've mentioned a couple of times that the Dangerous Discipline Program is divided into these modules. Each module has some key learning objectives. We want to make sure that those particular learning objectives are still met. But also, the second point here is that the learning must also have the overall effect that is desired. And then the third point is that it must be tested and to be appropriate for, for children. So in terms of that first point, testing the questionnaire must test the details according to each module. Eranthi's analysed those modules very carefully for the key elements in each. And she's developed a set of questions that are aligned to each one of those nine modules. We couldn't have too many questions for each module, but she's designed the questions very carefully that will allow us to test whether the module's been effective. In terms of the overall effect of the training, we need to, to start with an appropriate theoretical basis. So the previous questionnaires that we've used, the knowledge, attitudes, behaviors, supports, and barriers, they, they are kind of general, um, general assessments of the effectiveness of the program, but they lack a clear theoretical basis that encapsulates the whole program. And so we've been using the, this COMB model. Uh, it's a COMB stands for Capability, Opportunity and Motivation, Producing Behaviour. It's a health promotion model, a general health promotion model, and it's been shown to be quite effective. If you can develop capabilities, motivations and opportunities in a group of people, they're more likely to exhibit the behavior that you're hoping for. And so Aranthi's questionnaire is built around this COMB model and has as its test of over, the overall effect of training, some scenarios where they, these aspects of the training are captured. And as part of the questionnaire, there are questions that link into each of the four components of the COMB model. Then the third point there about the testing being appropriate for children, um, obviously for a questionnaire to be appropriate for a, a group of eight to 12 year old children, they have to be able to understand the questions. So they need to be reasonably simple. They need to be able to answer them in a, in a straightforward way. So the, the questions can't be too complex. And there should be some sort of comparability to that original knowledge, attitude and behavior questionnaire that was developed by the Americans and that we've used to show to demonstrate that the Dangerous Death Spells Program has um, capacity to work in this age group. So the, the next stage of Aranthi's work is going to be to run the training in, in a group of children and deliver both the new questionnaire that she's developed and the old questionnaire to them to ensure that annual questionnaire is effective. Then the next stage will be for Aranthi to use that new questionnaire to assess the overall effective training and the modular effective training in groups who have either had some modules removed, um, where in, that group, in those we would expect that the module relevance scores should change. So remember I said there are some questions in Aranthi's questionnaire focused on each of the nine modules. Obviously, if you remove a module, you'd expect that their understanding of the material covered in that might drop. For example, if we took out the module about how the human ear works. People probably wouldn't be able to answer, children probably wouldn't be able to answer the questions about that. But does it, and this is the second point here, does it affect the overall score on their um, COMB model? That's going to be the big question. Then secondly, uh, we'll try developing some new modules as I touched on before. For example, a module about tinnitus. Um, we'll also have to develop a new set of 
questions that become part of the questionnaire to assess that module. And again, we'll look to see whether the overall score changes. We may see that the overall COMB score improves as people know more about it and they understand about the impact of tinnitus on their lives. Or we may see the opposite. We may see that people are distracted by lots of extra information and, and get confused. We don't know yet. That's the beauty of research. So thank you very much for your attention and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk at these celebrations. Thank you very much, Professor Welch, for your very interesting and enlightening presentation. Okay, now we have some time uh, for questions and discussion. So, uh, Professor Prabhu, uh, we have two questions for you. So, the first question is, uh, what is the ABR protocol to use in the assessment on cochlear synaptopathy? Uh, Prof, I think you are muted. We can't hear you yet. Am I audible now? Now you are audible. No? Now you are Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, good question. So, what's the ABR protocol? So, the important aspect is we need to be testing it at a higher intensity. So, the ABR protocol would be in terms of intensity, we need to be testing at a higher intensity, which I mean, preferably at around 80 or 90 dB NHL. And you should be trying to do at a lower repetition rate and at 11.1 or 7.1. So we do it at a low repetition rate and high intensity. And you can use it using a single channel recording that should also be enough for a clinical setup. So with that, we need to check for the presence of uh, wave one and compare it with the normative that you have established for your clinic. And if there is a reduction in the amplitude of wave one, or at least when uh, more than 30 percent and definitely that indicates a possible uh, hidden hearing loss. Okay, thank you professor. There's another question for you. Um, so that is uh, for the speech in noise test, will the use of sentences over words increase the sensitivity of the test? So when we talk about uh, speech perception in noise test, uh, preferably the most uh, common uh, tests which check for speech understanding ability in noise are based on sentences. So uh, sentences check for more realistic speech understanding ability. So that is a better way of uh, testing. So any monaural low redundancy test which uh, checks for speech understanding ability in noise Preferably if I am given an option of words or sentences, sentences are always preferred over the words. Okay, thank you, Professor. We have a few questions uh, directed to Aisha. Um, so the qu first question is, uh, do you still give the three to six month hearing aid trial before going ahead with cochlear implants? Yes, that's a good question, yes. Um, in Sri Lanka, the common practice is to actually mandatory use of hearing aids before going for cochlear implant. One thing is the cochlear imp implant process takes a while. At least it takes about two to three months following we need to do vaccinations and all those things. So by the time they decide, collect funds and all those things. So it's a mandatory procedure to actually see if they are benefiting with the cochlear impl uh, with the hearing aids as well. So here it's a practice that we do give uh, hearing aids before uh, uh, fitting with cochlear implant. Okay, thank you, Aisha. Uh, another question to you is, is the auditory outcome similar if the cochlear implant is for a pre or post-lingual deafness in older children? Definitely different. I mean, you would see that when it's a post-lingual child, when it comes to a prognosis, they do see much better prognosis, especially because they do, they do have they do have language. So it's just a matter of teaching them how to hear from a different modality. 
Whereas when it comes to someone prelingually, when they are implanted at a much later stage in life, uh, we also do make sure we make the parents understand that they might not get the language input that they are expecting. They might not start talking normally like how a child, if they were implanted much earlier, would speak. But obviously we can work on their auditory skills and um, get them to respond to sounds uh, and maybe to speech to some extent. But when it comes to language development, uh, we might not see a big benefit. So in that case, uh, postlingual children do perform much better and we see better prognosis in cochlear implant at older children. Thank you, Aisha. The final question to you is, uh, when do you recommend as the best time to insert a cochlear implant? Earlier the better. <laughs> so, um, now here in Sri Lanka, most surgeons are more comfortable with doing the implant at around 11 to 12 months, if detected early. So, uh, most of them are a little bit, uh, and uh, now that FDA has given approval for nine months, uh, but in Sri Lanka, the earliest that we have implanted is 11 months, so uh, that's mainly because of surgeons. They are more comfortable with starting off at 11 months. So earlier the better. So if they can implant at 11 months, go ahead. That's, the, that's my recommendation. Okay. Thank you very much, okay. Aisha. Thank you. Um, so we are actually a little bit over time. Um, so we haven't got any questions for uh, Prof. Uh, Welch, but uh, I would like to uh, mention that the hearing health promotion programs for children is very important. I mean, targeting the children would be bit a better place to start, as you mentioned. So I think with Eranti's uh, PhD work, we can um, transfer most of that work uh, to our Sri Lankan um, children and the community. Uh, so Prof. Welch, uh, do you uh, think it would be uh, a good idea to target maybe teenagers also to have maybe a separate program for teenagers? Uh, it's a very interesting question. There's been quite a lot of work done around the world in um, trying to convince teenagers because obviously they're a group who is very much at risk nowadays because of these gadgets that we've all got that make so much loud noise through headphones. Um, however, almost all the work that's been done in teenagers has shown no effect. Teenagers will learn stuff, but they won't necessarily change the way they act. The one piece of work that I, I know was effective was the work that we did where we actually trained the teenagers to go and train the younger children. So it may be that we should, you know, set up a version of Dangerous Decibels in Sri Lanka and, and, and try and do that um, two-stage model where we t train teenagers in, in secondary school to go out to the local primary schools and train the younger children. And in doing that, the teenagers may train themselves, as it were, and it might have some effectiveness. What do you think? Should we try that? It's something we can definitely try. Thank you so much, Prof. Okay. Uh, so I want to thank our dis distinguished speakers for today uh, for spending uh, time and sharing their wealth of knowledge with us. Um, so I thank you once again. And as a token of gratitude, we are presenting you with a certificate of appreciation so um, we'll be sending the certificates to the overseas speakers and uh, i will present the certificate to aisha right now